Hello everyone at home, QWR friends and family, welcome to our nature, QWR nature news. We have a very special program today. Today is going to be all about a special type of rodent. Now, who here at home likes rodents? Anyone like rodents? Please tell me you do. I do. All right, good. Well, today you're going to be chin chilling with us, all right, <laughs> as we learn about one of the cutest, one of the softest mammals on the planet that we know of today, and that is the chinchilla. Who's ever met one of our chinchillas at the refuge? All right, good. Some of these chinchillas that we have have an amazing story, including the one that you're going to meet today. But they're in the family of rodents, so we're going to also talk about some of the cool rodent species that we have here on Long Island and some other types of pets. But these types of creatures have a very important role on this planet, in the ecosystem, and in the world of pets. We need to understand how to take really good care of them. So, does anyone have a pet at home? I do. Pet dog, pet cat, rabbit, fish, frog, little brother or sister. Good. All of those animals and creatures need special care, and it's a lifetime of uh, learning and a lifetime of um, really working hard to take the best care possible for them and of them. So we're gonna learn about one of our beautiful creatures today, like we said, the chinchilla. And for this creature, this is not your beginner pet right here. You're about to see a pet that I'd say is a level six to seven at least on the measure of one to 10, because the creature you're about to meet today is actually known to be more active, not when we're active in the daytime, but mostly active at night. And we call that nocturnal. Very good. So let's do say a little hello to our very good friend, Nugget. Can everyone say hello to Nugget? Hi, Nugget. Or you can say hola, como estas? Why? Because Nugget comes from a really cool place called the Andes Mountains, which is found near Chile and Peru, Bolivia they're found. So He's very squirrely, right? So you're looking at a beautiful mammal that looks like a mix between a squirrel and a giant mouse, all mixed into one. I would say even a rabbit too. Now, looking at Nugget here, we see he's got really large eyes, really good for running around at night. He's got these very long whiskers, excellent for feeling when he's out there uh, looking for his food, and these gigantic ears, which are great for hearing, all the different sounds while he's running through the mountains. Now, even though he looks like a cute little fur ball, right? He has these powerful little legs that are great for jumping, running at super speed, and this really cool tail right here. Just like this uh, squirrel's here on Long Island, he's called the Peruvian squirrel, and this tail's great for balancing as he's running around looking for food. So that brings us to a question. Nugget, what do you like to eat? Chicken nuggets? Nope. All right, no hamburgers either for him. He likes to look and forage for different seeds, plant material, right? Uh, here at the refuge, we give him very well-balanced pellets and hay and just a little bit of treats, including one of his favorites, cranberries or raisins. Let's see if he's hungry today. There we go, nice. <laughs> so as he's nibbling here, you can see that he has to he has to actually grab with one hand he can hold it with one hand just like you and i can hold our food he's the cutest when he's nibbling and as he's nibbling he's using these really sharp incisors so these teeth that are on the top and bottom that are super sharp and cut at a 45 degree angle and he can munch pretty th pretty much anything with those scissor sharp teeth oh he's already done with that that cranberry um rodents in general all have this they have these really gnarly yellow orange teeth that grow continuously, sometimes two to three inches a year, and they have to continually chew. So as they're chewing, they're grinding down their teeth. If they don't, their teeth can continually grow up and under. We've seen other pets where they have issues with their teeth go under their chin. So make sure you have enough chew toys for these creatures. All right, let's see if he wants a peanut for today. There we go. A little, well, no peanuts for today, no protein. He said, nope. So when you look at a creature like this, you realize this is the softest creature because he has tons of tiny hairs, very small fibers of hairs. And in each follicle, yeah, I wish you can feel him right now because you would just be like, wow, it's like petting, he's like petting a cloud. He grows multiple hairs, dozens of hairs out of one single hair follicle. We only grow a few. So out of all of these little follicles, he has this dense, fine fur. And that's what makes him extra, extra soft. And unfortunately, that's why they were brought to the U.S. Renee's going to talk about that later. So we have Renee and Kim with us today. We're going to do some awesome sharing of chinchillas and rodents as well. All right. Do you want to know what makes a chinchilla so soft? If you have one at home, you're going to have to see something really cool. 
You can't just get a bath for a chinchilla that puts them in water because they'd soak it right up. But with that fine, fine fur, chinchillas need a special type of dust bath that you buy at the store. Blue Beauty dust for this one. So this fine, <laughs> fine dust, if you tried to emulate this, it would try to copy the dust or ash, volcanic ash, in the Andes Mountains. But for these creatures, they love their dust bath because it covers every hair, makes them water repellent, which is really cool. He's ready to go in. <laughs> He's chomping up the bit. And even take, lets mites and other things not take residence in his fur. Are we ready for a super bath right here? Let's see. Let's see. Little chinchilla dust bath. So what they need to do is roll around in it, get it on their backs, their fronts, their sides. Whoop, there we go. Wait for it. And as they do that, he's powder coating all of those little hairs and also getting the, the oils that I just had on my hands off of him. And that's how they clean themselves. So like a reverse bath. That was pretty cool. Good flipping action. All right, he's like, I'm done, Mr. Tony. So let's see. There we go. He's now a powder puff ball. There we go. All ready to go nice and soft. That was very good. All right. So. Let me just show you something. We'll, we'll give him a, a minute to take a, just a second in here. There we go. He's going to actually get a chance to go and have a play date today. But before we do that, we're going to go over just a couple cool things. Other rodents. Rodents are really, really incredible creatures on the planet. There's over 40% of mammals on the planet are rodents, which means they have an important job to do, just like we do. So when most people think of rodents, they think of rats, they think of mice maybe squirrels, and the families of rodents, there's more and more that we need to learn more about and realize how special they are. So we have the littlest ones, such as meadow voles, right? And thank you, Kim, for these cool cards. <laughs> meadow voles, down to the smallest of shrews. Let's see, we even have an example right back here. Right, little tiny shrews. And they even have, let's see, they get bigger and bigger. I love the, we're gonna compare voles and moles, right? Close cousins. A lot of them like to burrow under the ground. That's where they make their homes. So you'll see a hole in the ground. And for a mole, it'll be a tunnel. Really cool tunnel. A vole, a little small hole going at an angle. And then another cool one is this one right here. The chipmunk. And this one makes a hole directly into the ground. Cutest little creatures, right? We see them all over the place now. And they're all doing the same thing. They're foraging, cleaning up the forest floor. It's very important to do. But as we look around the world, there's all different types from the smallest to the largest. And this is cool to see in the family, in the order of Rodentia, we have the tiniest of little guys called the Pygmy Jerboa. This one only weighs about three grams. He's the tiniest little guy running around. It looks like a kangaroo rat miniature version. And then if you go all the way back to South America, you get a chance to see this guy running around, the capybara, the largest rodent on the planet, weighing about, are you ready for this? about 150 pounds. That's huge. Imagine running into this and be like, Mom, I found a mouse. Uh -oh. <laughs> so these rodents all have special jobs on the planet. Now, some, sometimes people get confused with the rodents that we have and say, well, I saw a rabbit the other day. That's not a rodent. That's actually uh, in a whole different family called Lagomorph, and they're not rodents. Another creature that gets confused a lot is the bat. <laughs> Now, bats also are not rodents. They're one of the only flying mammals on the planet, and they are not in the rodent family whatsoever. And this friend of mine, who I love very dearly, gets confused for the rodent family because of this hairless tail, right? Say hello, everyone. There we go. This is the Virginia opossum, and this one is actually not a rodent at all. This is an, a special animal called a marsupial, the only type that we have on Long Island. So we want to know the difference between our rodents and other friends such as, let's see, the muskrat. He's one that looks just like a miniature beaver. I call them Long Island's beavers. They actually are more aquatic. They live in the water, they continually grow their teeth, and they eat all types of aquatic vegetation, which is really cool. So you might see something swimming around Long Island waters, not a beaver. If it is, let us know, but mostly muskrats. So they're also in the Rodentia family. Very cool. Now, if you did go to a place where beavers exist, which is one of the largest rodents that we have around North America, you might find one of these. If you look carefully, it looks like someone carved a pencil. But this is what we call a beaver chew. And what's spe special about this is when you study it, all rodents chew in the same type of pattern where it's a 45 degree angle. 
and that 45 degree angle is how they chew the wood, not eat it, so they can build their dams. So that's pretty cool to see. They have such tough teeth, they can cut through all types of wood and other materials, and once again, they have to, to stay healthy. So that's pretty cool to see. If you find one of those on the North Fork, it probably drifted all the way from Connecticut. Now just to show you those sharp teeth on rodents, here's an example of a muskrat. And you can see the teeth are orangey yellow, the incisors are very long on the top and on the bottom. That's for sitting there chewing at that angle. And then they have a whole series of molars in the back that help to chew their food even more. So that vegetation, nuts, or anything else that's hard, they can break right through and eat that up. Why are they important for the environment? Well, a couple of things. They're, they can disperse seeds, right? They can also become food for a lot of other creatures. That's why there's so many of them. For our chinchillas, they can have two litters of babies a year, and usually between two to five of those uh, babies uh, are, are born. Now, for Nugget, he came to the refuge in a very interesting way. He was actually brought by a woman who had found him in 2013. We'll bring him out one more time and then pass him over. But he was brought by a woman in 2013 who said that she found him running around a restaurant. Now imagine the face of the people walking around the restaurant seeing this gigantic rodent running around thinking they saw the largest mouse on the planet. Well, he was someone's pet that got away. And that's what makes us realize we need to make sure we take good care of our pets. And the one question is, how long do they live? Well, for chinchilla in the wild, you're talking about 10 years. Are you ready for this? In captivity, they can live up to 20 years. So that's a lifetime of responsibility and care. So you have to keep that in mind. Uh, how big do they get? Well, that's about it, about 15 inches long. Uh, just under two pounds, right? Now, if you get another creature, good thing you don't take capybaras home. You have a 150 pound rodent running around. Do your math beforehand. So they are a very, very delicate creature to take care of, including their housing. When you get a chinchilla, you don't just get anything. You want a very special type of house, and we'll take it for a short and we'll bring it right over. This type of housing, they need multiple levels. They need a lot of exercise, so there's different levels for them to run up and down. They have their own spinning uh, super wheel up here uh, as a gym, right? And they use that all the time when it's <laughs> nighttime. You're like, oh, I want to get in there. Um, that's what they use, but there's also chew toys of all types, wooden chew houses, huts, pieces that they can gnaw their teeth down, and they've got the full Taj Mahal of chinchilla houses right here. All these different levels to hang out, even a hammock, I could even live in here for free. Um, so you want to make sure you have the right type of habitat, chew toys and everything else to make them happy. Alright, now if you've been a part of this refuge family for a long time, you might have remembered our original beautiful um, chinchilla named Paco. Paco was here a long time ago. She was an absolutely amazing creature to work with and Paco and Nugget were, became the best of friends. And one day we came into the refuge thinking that Paco was a girl the whole, uh, a boy the whole time. We found out Paco was a girl and there was two babies in the, in the cage and one of them still is with Nugget. Guess what his name is? McNugget, of course. <laughs> Would you like to meet them as we go over to the next room? We're going to see a little playtime happen. This does not happen usually on any, any kind of program that you get to see, but we're going to actually let you see their playtime room. We're going to join Renee inside of here and show you the magic of how chinchillas love to run around and get their energy out. All right. Let's unite father and son over here. Say hi to Renee, everybody. Say hi, hi Renee. Everybody. So I actually want to talk to you guys a little bit about um, how these chinchillas actually came to the United States and a little bit about some conservation that we should be taking part in. So chinchillas actually came to the United States in the 1920s. There was an American coal mining engineer um, and he was really fond of these. He was out over in Chile, where these guys are most popular, and he wanted to introduce these guys to the to the United States. Um, he became really fond of him at that of them at that time. So he actually got special permission to bring about a dozen of these over from the United States or to the United States. And he took a really long time to bring them over because these guys 
are living up in the mountains at heights of about 9,000 to 14,000 feet. So they live at really high elevations. So what they needed to do, they needed to get acclimated to lower elevation. So he took about a year to acclimate these animals. He brought food from their, from their habitats down so he could give them their proper diet too. And this happened in the 1920s. He brought them over to California and he started breeding them there. In the 1950s, there was a huge, um, a huge uh, kind of growth of farming for these guys and, and breeding programs for these guys because they were actually bred for their fur. So just like Mr. Tony was saying, their fur is really, really soft and really dense and they were using these primarily for coats and things. So they were breeding them for those reasons. And by the 60s, there were thousands of chinchilla ranches and farms all across the United States. Um, some of these farms though then started to actually keep these chinchillas and home them as pets. I've got some chinchilla treats, we'll see if they want some. So they did become popular pets because they were so cute, as you can see, right? But the chinchilla population has greatly suffered because of over hunting, illegal hunting. There were laws in place in the 1920s for these chinchillas and legislation to protect them, but it wasn't being enforced. In the 1980s, they really started to enforce it in specific areas, but their populations at, at that time were still very, very low. So there are mainly two different types of chinchillas. There are long-tailed chinchillas and short-tailed chinchillas. So they believe that all of the chinchillas that are here in the United States, all the populations stem from those first 11 chinchillas that were brought here in the 1920s. And they're thought to be long-tailed chinchillas. So these guys are the long-tailed chinchillas. The chinchillas used to exist in not only Chile, but they also existed in the Andes Mountains, part of Peru and Argentina. Um, so they existed in other locations, but due to overhunting, now they're only found in two locations in Chile. So in 2008, they were put on the critically, con critically threatened list of animals, and now in 2016, they were actually considered endangered. Over the last 15 years, there has been a 90% decrease in their populations. So what can we do? We really have to protect these guys from being hunted, and the best way we can do that is by educating people about them. Um, wild chinchillas, are not really the chinchillas you're gonna ever find as pets. They're mostly taken um, from their bread in the United States, the chinchillas we have as pets. But it, just like Mr. Tony was saying, these guys are a lot of work. So it's really important to do a lot of research um, and share that research with your friends, right? That's a great way. Because education is key to change, right? Exactly, very good. Very good. Can everyone say thank you to Renee at home? That's the most important part of the message as far as conservation, saving these creatures that need our help. They're very cute to see. As pets, they require a lot of care, but we have to remember how do we preserve them in the wild? Now, the one thing I think is, they're not the only rodent pets out there. What are some other pets at home that you might have that's a rodent? Good, so you get hamsters, yeah, gerbils, right? I used to have fancy mice. Some people have rats as pets. So we really need to learn how they work and how their, their lifestyles are so we can take really good care of them. All right. To end, we're going to show you a cool craft. Come right back oh, in here yeah. and show you how. Yep. Yeah, and while Tony's getting his craft, if you guys have any questions about chinchillas, about our chinchillas, um, or any other rodents, um, native rodents, or otherwise, we're always happy to answer um, any questions. So, as those questions are coming on through and you're thinking really hard about your cool rodent questions, Something you can do at home with the family. This isn't just for kids. Why do we let all the kids have just the fun? Adults can do this too. A simple chinchilla craft, you can get two paper plates or construction paper. Think of your favorite cute chinchilla character. Name it if you want. Some construction paper for the ears, the tail, some staples, some markers, crayons, and you get the cutest little critter you can have at home. Doesn't eat much, very easy to take care of. Uh, and then maybe even add some whiskers on there, right? All those cool adaptations That's we talked super about. super cute. So, Simple things, recycle crafts you can do at home and reuse and celebrate our little furry friends. 
<laughs> Very cool. Oh, we have a question from Katie. She asks, do the chinchillas cuddle or are they constantly active? Yeah, so chinchillas are, um, like Mr. Tony said, they're nocturnal or sometimes called crepuscular active at dawn and dusk. Um, but they do, so during most of the daytime here, they are just snuggled up at the top of their enclosure. They are very uh, elusive or shy animals. Um, so they do kind of hide away if it's a busy day here at the refuge. In the wild, though, they can live up to, in herds up to 100 individuals. Wow. Um, and what's really cool is those individuals will help each other care for their young. So they work as a really great community. So our chinchillas do like to cuddle, and that's something that they would do in the wild, too. Very cool. Oh, um, Michael wants to know, why are their teeth orange? Oh. oh, one's so chewing on me. Hey! Do you want to talk about their teeth a little, Tony? Um, sure. So, all rodents, if you look closely at them, uh, they have orangey yellow teeth. It's the way they have a very strong enamel on the outside of their teeth that helps them to chew. Uh, they also have open rooted teeth that continually grow, like we talked about earlier. Um, and that's an important thing to know about your, your rodent pets. As they grow, they continually keep going, going, unless they have something hard to chew on and grind down those teeth. So if someone says, I'm not sure if it's a rodent or not, look for that special orangey yellow color and you'll know for sure that's it. Right. Um, another question from Jane. She wants to know, how fast can they run? Oh, I don't... I think... Um, I think that I read that they can dart like crazy fast speeds, like 30 or 40 miles per hour, but it's quick oh. bursts. Right. Um, it's really quick bursts. So they have some ways to evade predators. They're chewing everything. <laughs> um, they have some really cool ways to evade predators because they will have lots of predators in the wild too. Um, lots of birds of prey, sometimes snakes, um, things like that. And um, they're quick and agile nature is really what helps them, but they also have what's called a fur slip. So Ooh. they, if a predator was actually get a hold of them and to grab onto them, which is difficult, they can actually release patches of their hair at a time. So that's a, a very helpful thing to them, but their agility and their speed is really what helps them. That is amazing. One of my I least, don't know the exact speed. Least favorite defenses I heard of was peeing on you. Yeah. That's oh. a bad defense, but it works. So kids, don't try that at home. And I think some domesticated <laughs> chinchillas are known to do that too. Yep, they'll pee and, and evade. Our guys will nibble too a little bit and say, let me yeah. know. So, yeah. yep. Luckily. They have, they have a lot of, hey, they have a lot of calls, um, <laughs> different communication <laughs> noises that they make too. So we do know they'll like bark at us or, or kind of chirp at us a little. If um if they don't want to come out, so they'll they'll show those signals too vocally. Man, any more questions, guys? In the meantime, I'll try to get you a close up of these chinchillas, <laughs> yeah. but um, I'll put some chinchillas. They're very <laughs> mobile, so action shots. <laughs> they're like little parkour. They like to bank around the corners. No. They're all over camera. <laughs> they're they're really the camera. Here they are. Here we go. Here we go. There he is. There you go. Buddies. It's hard for me to film them when they're... <laughs> <laughs> so fast. Any more questions about chinchillas? Well, if anyone does, they right. can send in their questions also. And yes. Let us know, and we'll continue to help answer them as best we can. But exactly. hopefully in the future, you can come in the refuge when it's all opened back up again and everything's back to normal and visit them in their cool cage and say hello to Nugget and McNugget. Don't forget. Oh, um, Melissa wants to know if we, if we talked about how long they live. Oh, so yeah. we did, I think. But in the oh yeah, sorry. So Tony might have covered this, but in the wild, they live about ten years on average, and in captivity, they can live about twenty years. Um, McNugget, I think we estimate he was born in two thousand eight, uh, or Nugget, I'm sorry, and McNugget, I think, was born in two thousand thirteen. So Man. they're they're uh, pretty up there. And one more question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, is uh, from Helen. She wants to know if the chinchillas bite. Oh, they definitely can. Um, you know, we handle like a lot of different animals yes. here at the refuge, and the only ones, everyone's always afraid of snakes, everyone's always afraid of all the birds of prey. You know, the ones that really bite. Watch <laughs> out for the guys. cute ones. Yes. Yeah. Um, 
But it's usually a light bite in warning. They will nibble, especially if you stick your fingers inside their enclosures. But if they really don't want to be handled, usually they'll show us other signals that they're stressed before they do this, but they will bite you pretty pretty hard if if they don't want to be handled. No. Yeah. They'll also <laughs> nibble because they might think, look at that peanut right there. Yes. It's a little bit like a fingernail, any kind of nuts or shell things. It might nibble on your fingernails just to test it and make sure it's not a snack or food. So exactly. that's another reason why it might nibble sometimes. We Kids bite more though. <laughs> <laughs> we have one more question from Derek who wants to know if he can pet them when he's able to visit again. <laughs> ah, I don't blame you, Derek. <laughs> sometimes we take them out and we'll visit yeah. here and we teach everyone whenever you pet an animal, you always pet from head to tail. Exactly. That's the most comfortable way. Never to pet their face because when you meet someone new, you never shake their face and say, hi, nice to meet you. So we always respect their animals Ooh. and then always watch your hands after petting them like we always say so yep sometimes and, um, they're out for we also do our meet the animals program and during that program um let me see if i can get um during the meet the animals program um <laughs> you know occasionally we we take out the chinchillas and you might be able to pet them as well during that time oh um a question from dylan and lily um and they would like to know if their fur has different colors oh, yeah so question. chinchillas um have a variety of colors um, some of them are tan to white, there's grays like these guys. Ours are very difficult to tell apart, but one of them has a little brown patch on his tail. Um, so they can be a, a small range of colors. Um, and what's also really interesting is chinchillas from selective breeding are actually about two times the size of wild chinchillas. So our domesticated wow. chinchillas are much larger. Um, but yeah, they're all, all different grays and whites and tans. I've seen a half brown and a half white, half chocolate vanilla cookie one. That was a cute one. 50 50. That sounds extra cute. All right. Well, I think that's all of our questions for now. And um, thank you guys so much for joining us. I'm trying to get you a close up, but it's really hard. Um, so say goodbye to Renee. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much. And then say goodbye to Mr. Tony. Bye, everyone. See you soon. And um, yeah, I, please join us on Thursday for another segment at 1 p.m. And, um, you know, any more questions you have, feel free to comment below. Um, and as always, we are not for profit. So if you like this chinchilla video and you want to see more videos, um, please feel free to donate on our website. And uh, thank you so much. <laughs> Bye, guys. <laughs> Let's see if I can get. Oh, good. <laughs>